My name is Martin Hallowell. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Value Engineering Experts. Today I have a great mechanical engineer, Matteo Forgoni. Matteo is a friend, an associate partner of Footprint, an amazingly accomplished engineer, and I believe he's late 30s, maybe 37, 38. What's interesting about Matteo is he's had some significant experience in the drilling business and has moved on to have Fergoni Engineering Machine Shop, which does custom defense and aerospace work, uh, low volume, but uh, specialty work. And uh, when Matteo says go, we go. So that's kind of his model. And he, and he also does, uh, interesting enough, he also teaches. He's a master's mechanical engineer from Massachusetts Lowell and uh, gives back with a fourth year class. I'm sure you'll enjoy this. And many of his innovations can be connected to lowering CO2, which is typically a customer uh, trick for production in construction. And uh, I, I welcome Matteo Forgoni. Matteo, how are you doing? Good, Martin. How are you doing? Good morning. Thanks for uh, joining the podcast. Let's uh, talk about, let's go back to uh, the hub. Hub is mm -hmm. really interesting because Hub is quite an interesting company. I think uh, the family name is Maxwell, started by Francis Maxwell and Jim right. Maxwell, one of his sons, uh, mm -hmm. was nice enough to give you a job, which I guess there was no jobs when you came out of school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much everything had tanked at that point, I think, uh, you know, uh, and uh, but yeah, I got involved with with Hub as a Mechan like purely mechanical, you know, mechanical engineer. So I got kind of sucked into a couple of projects that were kind of things that they got involved with that they just needed someone to design some parts for some rigs and do some weird things that were part of like some university research projects. And and then as I started playing around with certain things and I designed something, you know, someone would get curious and be like, hey, like, you know, would you get to draw one of these or could you design one of those? And, and, and they'd be like, you know, we pay so-and-so this much for that. I'm like, I don't understand why you're paying so much. Like we could just have that cut out of a piece of plate and weld that onto this. And we could do that for this. So, you know, a lot cheaper. And so I started doing that over and over and over. And then it was like, do you think you could design one of these tools? And do you think you could design that? And, just, and the list just kept getting larger and larger. So I was like, every day I was over there, you know, and looking at something until eventually, I ended up talking to to Jim and 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 he was like, you know, would you want to get involved doing more than just like mechanical design? He's like, you know, we, you know, to do, you know, it, what, what it ended up being like basically machine design, mechanical design, designing equipment, designing tools, modifications to equipment, custom equipment for jobs, like things to make the logistics and the jobs go easier. Uh, and then also planning projects, going out in the field, running them. So I ended up really getting it specializing in uh, micro drilling, limited access micro drilling um, and all the complicated jobs. So we'd have jobs that were, you know, extremely difficult or would be complicated in the city or, in, you know, in just other situations would make them complicated. And I was enjoying basically planning, uh, you know, like basically visualizing, planning how the whole thing was going to play out, right? And get it all organized and, and get it, you know, get the right, you know, basically design and build the right things to go out there and do the project. Right. So it's a mix of the kind of mechanical engineering, the civil civil world, you know. So so that's I, I really learned, uh, even though I grew up, you know, on, on job sites like my you know father did construction and my brother's in construction and grew up around construction and things like that when I was a kid. Um, I learned the civil, the geotechnical and the geostructural related stuff um, just by being out there doing it and just by seeing it and, and being involved, you know, being out there for you know, long days, long nights, you know, grouting micro piles at, you know, one in the morning, you know, just getting it done and, and asking a lot of questions, you know, asking the people who were experts because Boston, you know, there's so much technology in uh, foundation drilling that was developed here because of the, all the different conditions that exist. There's, there's every condition you can imagine in like a, basically a 30 mile radius around the city. So you could get into anything. I mean, deep clays that can go 300 feet before you hit bedrock and then stuff that's just total garbage. There's, you know, there's fill, there's all sorts of rock. Um, you know, it's just crazy. So, so everyone here who has drilled or done work, this type of work for years and years and years, they're all around because it's a very, you know, as you know, it's a small industry, even though it covers the entire world, there's 
not that many people who actually do that type of work, right? So, so we're surrounded by a lot of people with a lot of experience. That's how I learned. I'd just be like, you know, explain to me what's going on there. How, how does that work? You know, especially on those long drives, you know, at five in the morning to the job site or long drives out to New York, you know, you're not going to do anything else. So you're just talking about like, how are we going to deal with the water pressure at five o'clock in Albany, New York, when everyone starts using the water and it drops 20 PSI and we no longer have pressure to flush the hole, you know, things like that. So, so you start having those conversations, just figuring things out, you know, so it's kind of fun, you know? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and you, you know, it's working in construction, obviously you get that early, early work ethic. What do you, re yeah. quick recommendation, would, would you recommend that a mechanical engineer that uh, would, would experience you know, foundation drilling or really there's just so many things that they can do. Most guys are want to be a mechanical engineer right off the bat. Right. Yet you became a very good one by being in an industry and helping them be productive. Right. Yeah. Learning yourself by asking the right questions would be a tip for the young yeah. person. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I think that the, the most important thing is to always like, remember that you really probably don't know anything, you know, and like go into it like that. And just like wanting to learn, you know, if you, if you pretend like, you know, how this stuff works, I mean, especially in an industry like that, where it's, it's so like most, I guess most people, like when they drive down the road, they don't realize how much has been done underground to make all the infrastructure around them work. Right. And I didn't even know any of that stuff really. Like you just like, Hey, it's a bridge. I don't know. Well, every single one of these overpasses over the highway is on a on a 39 inch, you know, drilled shaft, every single one of those piers. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then you start thinking like, OK, those are all drilling jobs or that one's on driven piles and that's on this and that has tiebacks and this has micro piles. Right. So I think it's important to know, like to in any situation, like you get into any you can get into any industry by just not going in and pretending you know how to do it. Right. You have to go in and you get to kind of, you know, find people and, and you can directly ask people. Like I would ask certain guys who I was close with and be like, Hey, like I'm going to be doing this for a while. Like, can you, if I have questions, can I just ask you, you know what I mean? Um, so I understand better with, you know, exactly what's going on. You know what I mean? So, because you really, you want, you need to be able to understand in order to do a good job because when it does go bad and foundation around, it goes real bad. Right. So it's, uh, so you really don't want to, you, you don't want to be, the late night. Yeah, yeah. Hey, tell me, have you ever actually, you must have done a micropile yourself or tried the controls to really appreciate them? Like, did you oh, ever yeah, yeah. an operator and Jim and uh, Jim said, can you, can you run the rig tonight or anything like that? Or Yeah, we've had to, yeah, I've had to, you know, sit in the seat in a, in a crane and bob the tremmy up and down while a guy has to go to the bathroom or something like that, or, you know, put a pile in because the guy, you know, had to, you know, go and, you know, go somewhere else or whatever. And, and, um, you know, so, front of the machines and because I understand, you know, all the mechanics of it, right. Because I'm designing all the tooling and all those things. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm hands-on. I can visualize and, and, you know, have good high hand, hand coordination. So, so even like temp casing, like I did one where, you know, we, you know, running casing down and pulling casing out and all that stuff. And, um, but you gotta be super careful, you know, you, you know, the, the microplast stuff's very hands-on, you know? So like, uh, I know one time one of my foreman, he had, you know, rent, wrenched his back, you know, just like, you know, probably turned the wrong way and um, couldn't, couldn't work, you know, and we're uh, so like we had uh, uh, five footers, you know, we're in the basement of a building, you know, down 90 or 100, 110 feet or whatever. So we're just like, you know, you basically old school, you take the rod wrenches and just trip out all the, all the rods before you grow out the pile. So you just, you know, you're standing down there, you're, you know, knee deep in the mud with your boots, with the, you know, and just like uh, throwing a wrench on, you know, put a strap, pull, pull the rod out, get it up. The guy grabs it with a fork truck from over and just keep going. And you don't count. You just wait until there's no more ro rods coming out of the hole, you know? So, so. Yeah, no, uh, I've, I can relate. The micro piles. So, so really, so you told me that uh, Jim's dad, Francis, was a pile driver. Yeah. But yet, you know, uh, Jim himself today does micro piles, shotcrete, Slurry walls, sea cans, casans. It's also interesting enough. Bought the first soil mac, right in, in uh, North yeah, America. Yeah, yeah, yeah back in the nineties. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah. So he was super progressive. He just looked at it and said, "I think this is, you know, where it's going to go." And kind of, you know, did one of these. You know, hey, let's try try this. You know, uh, and and bought the soil mac. Uh, I think an R ten. And, um, you know, well before my, my time and, and got into it and, 
and you know of course there were bumps in the road and stuff like that but you know the guys locally here in, in uh, Rhode Island American equipment and fabricating you know they were the you know the uh, dealer and those guys have always been good support and the mechanics there who are still around you know you know right now at this point a lot of the guys from that era you know kind of getting retirement but yeah bought their drills and started getting into it and getting into that and and that's when you know a lot of the the you know drill shaft technology started advancing more and more and more was when the big dig happened here in boston you know which was a you know basically a i don't know two billion dollar project that cost 14 billion dollars by the time it was done um you know and uh and that's where you know uh, a lot of the slurry technology was developed here um because they just ran into situations where these companies had to develop these new like polymer slurries and things like that and to deal with the, the, the soils and stuff like that so open hole a lot of open hole you know drilling and slurry so um, yeah. but yeah that I agree. Very good market to learn from. I, you know, Toronto has very good soils in comparison to Boston. Yeah. And uh, I think ape piling even used to be successful doing their geothermal there because of the high water table, which mm -hmm. was a steel geothermal. As you know, I've got one that's similar, only has multiple rings called an FEB right. cell. Uh, so that's interesting. You know, it's just to touch a bit on family, you have three kids, right? Yes. And they yeah, obviously know much. that... You, they, they know that you're a Red Bull skateboard champion. Do they know that? Yeah, yeah. They, I, and my girls skate too. You know, I have a skate, like a little skate park in my barn up on the second floor in one of the hay lofts. And so they, they rip around up there. And, you know, I, I do, uh, I still do uh, lessons on Saturdays when the weather's good in, in Lowell here, uh, like a free, free group clinic. So anyone can come. I just teach for free. Um, and uh, so a lot of young kids who, and if they don't have boards, whatever, I, you know, we'll give them skateboards and I bring extra boards for kids. And if someone doesn't have one and they can't afford one, just give them a skateboard, you know? So, um, so that's fun. You know, I, I still skate. I love to skateboard. I've been doing it for 27 years, you know? So probably the, probably the thing I've done the longest in my life. And you were a Red Bull champion, which is something significant. I understand in the skateboard world, like you had your own signature board. Yeah, I had a, uh, so with Worship Skateboards, which is a company out of Connecticut, I had boards like with my name on them, you know, so like the first one was like the Mr. Mateo head. So it, looked, it was like a Mr. Potato head, you know, not uh, like uh, play on words, right? So it had my face on it, like stickers you could stick on the face, you know, like it came with a pack of stickers. So you could make it like, you know, like busted teeth or funny eyes or things like that. It's kind of funny. Um, so it said like Mr. Mateo head skate pack or whatever. It was like a caricature of my face. And then a couple other ones, uh, I had like three other boards with them. And it was in like 2003 to 2005, 2006, something like that. So, and my thing with Red Bull was good because like I, I rode, you know, for them and, but also worked for them. So it was like kind of a combo, right? Where it's like, they needed a pro level athlete to do basically like marketing and brand management at a specific huge account, which is an action sports camp, right? So, so it worked out good because me being, you know, naturally good at, you know, just, uh, you know, working with people and sales and things like that. And I was very young. I mean, I was like 19. When I, I pulled that, pulled that job. In. And, and uh, so I did that for like three or four years. And uh, so it was great. Like, you know, I had all the perks of the, the, you know, the athlete side of it, but I also was able to learn a lot about marketing and, and business, like, and from Red Bull uh, at that time, especially the, um, kind of the like grassroots guerrilla marketing stuff, which is made them so successful. Um, a lot of that stuff I've, I've always used, um, going forward, you know, it's a very like natural organic way of like, of like selling a product, right? Like brand recognition and like very subtle ways of doing it, like letting the product sell itself, not being like, you don't have people out there like necessarily like, selling it, you know what I mean? So certain nuances to it and that can help a lot, you know, when, Sometimes people don't like being sold, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like real sales guys, you know, pushing stuff. Like that. Yeah, it gets a little thin. Um, yeah. Although you got to have sympathy for the salesman. I always try to return salesman's calls. I yeah. found that, that that was meaningful. When I would call somebody back within 24 hours, they thought, oh, geez, you know, thanks for calling me back. Right, you, sure. Yeah. So let's go back to the Solmax and in particular, a, a mutual friend, Steve Wilson. Steve's still at it. I think he's, isn't he out west in western canada now or is he down in utah so yeah he's in salt lake city he's out of salt lake city but he's but you know his company western equipment solutions they cover you know basically 
you know, most of the, you know, you know kind of west of the Mississippi, down in Texas a little bit, up up to, you know, the border of Canada and then western Canada, BC and stuff like that, and a couple other places too. But he kind of doesn't have necessarily borders, you know. I mean, Steve's a someone who will, you know, is, you know, there's obviously certain territories to, with dealers, right, who are dealing for the same equipment, but like. Um, but he also is a good um, because he's he's a good resource because he's actually a geologist, right? So, you know, had ex, you know experience in you know working in you know the steel industry, and steel mills, and then mining and all these other things, right? And out there actually doing that type of work, like prospecting for um, for things. So, so he has a different experience than a lot of people that work in, in some of these like drill rig, you know, dealerships, so to speak, um, as a resource. And um, so he and I. Like when I was with Hub, like I, I would have projects where we might need like, especially like the Leffer stuff, because he's, he's the guy who would buy all the Leffer uh, equipment through. And um, so I might need like a spherical grab or we'd need to get some, you know, a chisel or something like that, a Leffer chisel. And we and we'd never even dare buy like, you know, because these jobs are so critical, we would never dare buy like a Chinese knockoff or something like that, right? Like, it's just like, I need to get the job done. At least, you know, if you buy the Leffer one, the thing's going to work yeah. perfect, right? You know, so um, you can control the you know, I, know Michael, I know Michael Lepper too, you know, and it's like, you know, you when you go to, you know, their, you know, like their factory in Germany and you see, you know, how well they, you know, do their work and you see the quality of the product and you, you know how well it works, then you have a certain level of confidence there, right? So, so you get confidence in these people and they become resources who you can call and ask questions if you have a problem or just trying to figure something out. But Steve and I are really good friends. You know, we, we talk on, you know, almost every day and uh, Steve's a great guy. He might actually be a good podcast guest. He's been through yeah, a lot of sure. stuff and he's got some gray hair. Not that yep. that's a requirement, but uh, lately I've been doing young guys and the young guys sure. are great. Tell, tell me a little bit. I know there was one job you did. I think it was in Canada where you build an under reamer. You had a contractor that was going through a very difficult drill job and uh, the consultant wanted to, get the casing to the bottom of the hole correct right yeah so i don't i don't know exactly what the reason was why they needed to have the diameter of the hole larger than the casing all the way to the tip and be able to run the casing down but you know they're using segmental casing um and the holes were as deep as i think 30 you know 30 meters or something like that and um so you're talking like uh, you know 90 to 100 feet deep total total depth right and they um so the, what happened was they were on the job and they they thought by using whatever method they were using, they could actually get it done. And they were getting a hole done every like one every seven to nine days or something like that. It's very slow. And, you know, when you're when you buy a job like that, right, you did this thing and you think I'm going to do one every day or one every two days and it's one every nine. You know, you're just looking at the clock wondering when you're going to go out of business, basically. Right. <laughs> like you like you like if you can't. Your competitor is saying, you know, it's the best job I never got, right? Yeah, they're like, they're like watching you just die on the vine, right? So, 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 you know, so, uh, you know, that one is one of Steve's, you know, customers for Western. And, um, and they were like, hey, we really need, we need some help. We need a tool to be able to help deal with this situation. So he happened to be coming to Boston to do, to visit here for something. And the timing was perfect because he came in, you know, we, uh, he came to my office and he was like, Hey, I got the situation. You know, I, I think we can make, you know, a, a, a tool that would open up under the casing. He's like, but it, it has to, you know, be able to withstand, you know, drilling in solid rock. Right. So it's a little bit unconventional. Like most tools that open up and do these things that aren't like a, like a hammer or something like that, typically you're using like, like for belling clay, right. A belling bucket or things like that. But this is made to like drill solid rock. So so we kind of did a little dry erase board session and a couple sketches. And I was like, okay, I think I have an idea how to mechanically make this stuff work. You know, and he, he and I kind of figured out, you know, number of teeth to create the right amount of pressure based on the hardness of the rock to, and things like that. And how, how many we wanted to engage at a time and how to space everything out. So we came up with this, we call it a reamer barrel. And because it's not used very often, there's no reason to you know, really do anything beyond just make, make them and, and sell them or rent them as, as needed, you know. Um, but it's, uh, so you basically drill a pilot hole down, you know, to the bottom, of, to the bottom of your shaft. 
uh, wherever the tip is, and you bring this down to, uh, they bring the reamer barrel down below the bottom of the casing, and then you just rotate forward, it opens up, it locks open, and it can't close unless you go in reverse. So um, it will open up and gauge on the rock to the gauge diameter, so we can, we can design it to open to a specific diameter. And, and you just rotate and go down and all the, it's designed to take all the rock, tear it off the sides and drop it right into the middle of the hole. And so you can obviously only run down as far as you basically end up with a pile of, of basically tailings in the middle. And then you take that out, you go down and you can take an auger or a bucket or whatever and just, just clean it out. And then you run it and keep doing that until you get to the bottom. So, so you had to make a couple passes because you're going to fill up the hole. And um, so I ended up doing um, going from like one every nine days to I think multiple shafts per day um, in this case. That's amazing. Yeah. Steve, uh, Steve obviously uh, would have a loyal customer for a number of years after producing that tool. So yeah. essentially what it is, is an up, upward, upside down belling tool really. Yeah, pretty much. It kind of looks like an upside down, like the wings that you typically see in a belling tool this way, they're really like this, but there's very, very little, uh, tiny little nuances to it where if you don't understand why it's designed a certain way, you know, you might be like, oh, it doesn't need that. We just, you know, if someone tried to copy it, they, they might copy what it looks like, but they definitely would rip it off and have a, you know, be doing a fishing exercise <laughs> down, you know, down in the hole. So that's very important, you know, like my, that's part of, you know, what I learned working in foundation drilling is like, there's like, there's like, normal duty and then there's heavy duty and then like here where where we are because i was with hub and then we say and then there's hub duty you know which is like extra 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 heavy duty right so it's like you can't once you realize that like just designing based on you know calculations and numbers is not enough to deal with the fact that things are going to get handled unbelievably rough they're going to be deep down on the ground you can't afford to have anything break you know, like you cannot have a nine foot diameter tool fail 160 feet down you know, on the job site for a $350 million building. Like it's like, it's not happening. You cannot let it happen. Right. So we, you know, you, everything is overkill. Um, and you're thinking like, well, it's probably good enough like that, but I'm going to beef it up or I'm going to add these little details in here. I'm going to make sure that this stuff is extra heavy, make sure that there's places for the load to go and they're not relying on, for instance, like a pin to take a shear load. You have like dead stops, hard stops, like certain things in there. So it's all little mechanical tricks we can play to isolate and, and, and you know, basically um, break up instead of having combined loading on things, you know, we can isolate the load. So we only have one type of load on one thing at a time. So um, I like to play those games and when I'm doing my, my mechanical design. So. Yeah. I'm sure the foundation industry, arguably made you a unique mechanical engineer and you know it, it would be a I, I got into uh, some custom drill rigs over the years and would do my own tools and whatnot at hc matcon but uh and that was a big cost advantage i could build tools for a third the cost and the, you, sure. could, you could fix them was a big advantage right yeah and job specific and like you say uh, use proper steel uh sometimes the casting is necessary the best coming out of China and how do we know these suppliers if we don't use the Germans the uh sure. anyway that's very interesting and so uh, we've gone through that so tell me a little bit about uh what you're doing now with Fergoni engineering because I'm fascinated by any type of, of, of fabrication work and uh you talked briefly about a like you're doing uh military and aerospace correct yeah for instance uh and then you're still playing a little bit. You, you, you mentioned about the joystick controller before we move away from construction completely. What, yeah. what mean was that for, by the way, the joystick controller? So, you know, like in, in micro drilling and, and handling small diameter casing, you know, people are trying to use manipulators, you know, mechanical manipulators, hydraulic grabs, right, to grab casing and rods at the same time and duplex load and for tiebacks or, you know, vertical piles, things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's safer. Um, it can be, even though it may technically be, you know, slower, um, it, it, it would be consistent and you don't have someone getting their hands in there. Right. So you, you, you avoid the potential, you know, loss of fingers or people getting crushed or being out of work, you know? So, um, 
so you, you know you can buy these manipulators that are designed to go on machines and they are never fully integrated you know it's very rare right so you have a manipulator shows up from let's say like you know a, a, like a german manufacturer right so you, you think shows up in a crate you've got an excavator it needs to be put together so the master mechanic or the mechanic is going to integrate all that stuff make sure it all works and they may and then you're like well how do i control it properly so now you've got typically you know your original controls for your machine has switches and buttons that control the machine but not all not you know eight different other hydraulic functions so in this case what we did was we took like the we took the rex roth joystick we took the complete plastic part off of it we uh, modeled a total uh, replacement with additional uh, spaces for um, rocker switches and relocated all the switches so that each hand could stay completely on uh, the two joysticks and have all new controls and we 3d printed the whole thing packaged it up all the wiring all the electronics and then they were able to just wire everything right back to the manipulator so now you have a a, a system where it's fully integrated it's ergonomic you know we made it so that for example like the motion of the switch is like one switch with your thumb would move up and down but the one below it would move left and right so you couldn't mistake them even if you're not looking at them right because you have to remember the operator is not looking at the switches he's looking at the tool right and he's look, trying to move you know the machine swing boom curl this that grab the casing rotate all these things at once so he has to just be able to feel it yeah right so he's there and we decide we basically broke up the the functions so that things that you would need to do at the same time would happen on two different hands at the same time right so it makes it so that it just makes sense so i actually rather than just doing like what i would call like the ivory tower engineer engineering exercise like an academic exercise where you're like well let's make a joystick put switches on there and let them just you know use it and they can just figure it out you know I, I go over, I look at the machine, I talk to the mechanic, I figure out everything I can. I get all the pieces, all the parts, take pictures, take measurements, take the parts back to my place. And then, then I call and talk to the people actually running the equipment, you know, and I ask that's them key. like, that's which key. functions are you using? How are you doing it? Explain to me, talk me through it. Right. And then I started thinking about it like, okay, we're going to have to do it like this because if you want to be able to curl and roll this and open this at the same time, we need to make sure those, those are, you know, you know, separate. So, um, and we did, I, I think I turned that around like three days. Wow. That's the big thing. When I think about going to a supplier, an OEM, first of all, they don't necessarily have a guy like you and they would, they, they would deny it yeah. or they would say, Oh, that's not, we can't, we don't have that in our catalog. Mm -hmm. So a gestation, we could call it gestation would be three days. Like some, yeah. Um, in your mind, you 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 were almost ready to go to drawings then, right? Basically, you 3D print that, or yeah, we just printed it. I mean, I literally had working working units in three days, so um, wow. back to them and they, and they installed it. So within a week, they had the thing up and running on the job site. So, um, so and then your so, so then we shop today. Sorry to interrupt you. Your machine shop today is low volume, high value add. Yeah, high value add, high mix, right? So everything's different. It's all low volume, high high mix, high value add, right? Um, usually quick turnaround stuff, weird things, oddball things, you know. And that's what's fun, you know. Like, um, you know, you start making a hundred or a thousand or something, and you're like, you start looking at the clock, wondering when it's time to leave, right? So, but we're always doing something different. So there's not enough hours in the day. I mean, like, you know, it'd be five, six, seven o'clock, and and I'm and I'm like, I, I feel like I just got started, you know. <laughs> at, you know in the evening not in the morning right so uh it, it goes goes quick when you're doing all these different things so the other the other one i wanted to ask you about was your the project the umfd inspection tool that sounds very interesting which is for a different customer group a much bigger yeah idea right yeah Maybe. so we do we design a lot of inspection equipment um you know things that are used in quality processes or um, inspection and uh, reliability in defense electronics. So, so um, that particular device is a device that we developed in conjunction with BA systems. And so we have a joint patent with, with them. And, um, and so I, it's my product that we, you know, we sell, but we developed it, um, you know, with them and, and they're kind of the first uh, customer to use it internally. 
And uh, so it's used right now on the like the um, F-35 line, so the fighter jets here. And so they so they make you know obviously electronics that are used in in, in you know um, defense, you know uh, electronic warfare systems. And what it does is you it's an it's an accessory that goes onto a microscope, and so it goes on in like one minute, just clamps right onto the objective, comes with a foot switch, and it replaces the white ring light that they normally use to look and illuminate whatever they're looking at with the microscope, but it has a, a, a specific, uh, like a 460 nanometer blue light and, and, and actual optical filters, and then also a UV light. And you can switch between those and filter out uh, certain wavelengths of light so that you can, so we're basically sending a very, very pure wavelength of light down that will actually excite and fluoresce certain elements that you are things that you don't want on your devices. Right. So it's basically to look for if you see anything glowing, when you see this blue light, you'll see it glowing bright, you know, green, orange, whatever. Um, you know it needs to be either cleaned or reworked or something like that. So um, so there's a lot of different applications for it and high reliability electronics. Now, like cheap electronics, things that are going basic consumer products or something like that, you would never even use something like this. You know, you, the stuff doesn't have a long enough life, life cycle. There's not enough potential risk for having a failure. You know, if your cell phone just stops working. Well, you just, you know, go to, you know, Verizon and get another one. But, you know, if the EW system in a fighter jet stops working, you know, people die, right? So like special um, clean room, special clean room manufacturing specs. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that they make is unbelievable. I mean, I can't talk about the actual, actual product, but like when you start seeing the level of uh, technology and processes that exist that you didn't even know existed and you see them being implemented to make some of these electronics it's just mind-blowing i mean i've seen some complicated stuff but I, i'm still amazed sometimes i see these things and i'm just i'm, I'm amazed it's unbelievable really that, that it even that it even can be done it, it's ridiculous so so it's fun to get involved with those like when we developed that thing it took almost probably two two or three years of you know real hard like you know iteration and printing parts a lot a lot of it's printed the chassis is printed you know, we make a lot of other parts. We ended up developing our own electronics, our own LEDs, um, like LED metal boards, heat sinks, all that stuff. It's all all um, all custom. So very uh, interesting, good good all around electromechanical packaging, um, and then a, a, a legitimate solution that's used. So we so we sell a lot of these different little tools to to electronics manufacturers, micro chisels to clean up epoxy, you know, in areas that it you know it shouldn't be, or little um, you know really small small tools and things like that. So. Yeah, that's that's uh, let's um, let's talk about your your. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that you, you find the time to uh, teach not only the, the skateboarding, which is seemingly not a revenue producer, but then you get a certain amount of money. I imagine for teaching at your alma mater of, of uh, yeah. Lowell. So yep. tell us a little bit about. Is it a fourth year class? I would imagine a fourth year class. Yeah. Yep. I teach a thermal fluids uh, lab class, so basically it's a lab with uh, with a lecture that goes along with it. And um, so, like in the spring, this I do four sections of lab and, and the lecture, and in the fall, um, which is the heavier uh, load, just based on the fact that typically it would be in the first semester of the fourth year, senior year, uh, that you know most people would take that class. Not that it necessarily has to be, but that's where we get the most students. So in that case, we could have like 150 to, you know, even 175 students. Um, so in the fall, I co-teach it with uh, another professor. And then in the spring, I teach it on my own. So I have four sections and then the lecture. So um, so basically five classes, you know, you know, times per week um, where, I'm at, where I'm there. So and it's good. You know, I mean, like the, the thermal fluids, it's basically um, experiments in heat transfer and fluid flow, right? So we're looking at, um, you know, experimentally, uh, you know, measuring velocity profiles, uh, heat transfer over flat plates, over cylinders, all these kind of characteristic fundamental examples that are good foundations for just understanding, conceptualizing, like how that stuff works, you know? And that's why I tell the students, you know, it's like, yeah, it's great that you're doing all these calculations and, and these academic exercises, but just because you can do math that matches some correlation that someone developed back in, you know, the, you know, the thirties or the forties or fifties. And that's in a textbook. doesn't really mean anything. Like, what does it actually mean to you? Like, do you understand what's happening here? Right? Like, 
like conceptually. So I, so when I talk about the things when, when, when they have questions, usually I try to give practical examples, like so real world examples, but also I don't just say like, oh, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Like, I don't want to be on the spot. Like, you know, try like, I'll just be like, oh, well, well let's think about it. Right. And I'll just kind of talk through it out loud, just like we would on the job site. Like, Hey, what's happening? Okay. Well, it looks like this is the problem. This is what's going on. You know, the heat is going over the plate like this. So what does that mean? And, you know, what is the, what's happening here? Right. Just like, just talk about it. Right. You know, so kind of, I think kind of a lot of times like not being, it's okay to like, even though I'm the professor, it's okay to not really know and have an answer and just be like, well, let's think about it together. You know, that's problem solving. That's engineering, you know, like we don't, you know, if we just want to look up things in books and have answers, we don't need engineers, right? Just find it in a book, Google it or something. Right. <laughs> so that's a great, that's a great way of putting it. So it's really about teamwork. So yeah. maybe laying the foundation for teamwork and telling the stories because you're allowed to go off. There wouldn't be a hard agenda. I guess you're allowed to take 15 minutes in the middle of that class. And yeah. Maybe something comes to mind and you think, well, I haven't covered this before, but it's not down on a piece of paper for you. Right. You're talking from yeah. experience, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't really go off the script. Like I'll have slides and, and I'll start going. And, and I've honestly had classes where I'm like, you know what? I'm like last week I was talking about this and I mentioned, you know, maybe like, like, for example, one week I was like, you know, it was like, I kind of have been talking about, we're talking about a lot of filtration, you know, like, like flow through porous media and things like that. Right. So, and then I had, had to get this big reverse osmosis system to filter the water from my water jet. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm going to talk about reverse osmosis and water filtration tomorrow. I just like, and I, I literally, you know, it's a, it's a one hour lecture. I didn't even have any slides. I went in and five minutes before the class, I opened up in Google Chrome a whole bunch of different windows of all the things like the subject type matter that I wanted to talk about. And I just talked to the, to the stuff at, like just live, just on the, off, off the cuff. I was like, this is how this works. This is where it's used. These are the ways these things integrate, you know, because you know, bad. that's real, you know, that's how, that's how real life is. There's no, like, you can't always prepare for a conversation or a situation of when you have to explain something, you know, so to be able to do that and, be, and go off of your experience or research it. Right. So um, so I've, so I've done a lot like that where I might have planned to talk about one thing and then I'll ask the question, like, has anyone ever seen one of these or has anyone ever, um, does anyone know what this is? And if no one answers, I'll just stop what I was originally planning on talking about and I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes explaining it because I'm not going to go on and assume that they are going to go back after, figure out what I was talking about that they needed to know before I even talked about what I did talk about. Right. You know, you know, it's not going to happen. So what's going to happen is they're going to be like, they're going to go, eyes are going to glaze over, right. They're going to get on their phone and just, you know, look at something else instead of listening to me. So it's really about engage, like you try to engage them into being like, Oh, you know what, this is actually kind of interesting. You know, like I'm not just here to try to graduate in the spring. Like, you know, and I tell, I tell them all the time, eventually you're going to have to be a real engineer you're going to have to solve problems. Someone is going to ask you to, you know, give them a yes or no answer. Like, is it okay for me to launch the rocket? You can't be like, well, I'm not sure if the, you know, <laughs> it's yes or no, like, like, like go, no, go, right. These types of situations, you know? And so like the, the words that I always, that always bother me. Like if you have an engineer who's working for you, you're like, Hey, are those drawings all set? And they're like, yeah, they should be. And I'm just like, Oh, I'm like, they, they throw out the S word and I'm like, oh boy. I want you to be the final check all the time, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, why don't you just do your job and just wrap it up? Like, <laughs> because, like, you know, and me, like, and the same with you, right? You're a professional engineer and I'm a professional engineer, right? We're both PEs, right? And, and it's like, like when I get to a, a point where I send it out, I'm done with it. That's it. Like, there's no like, oh, I have to, I have to redo it again after the customer like that, like it's done. Like I, I have to close it out and be like, that's good. You're good to go, you know, because, you know, I put my stamp on it. I put a signature on it. I've told you it's good, you know, and, and I'm responsible for that. Right. There's a certain amount of accountability that goes along with that. So, and I think some people, I, I kind of made a funny post on, you know, like, I don't know, Instagram or something uh, a few months back when I was having one of those frustrated moments you know, where no one's finishing their work and I have to check everything. And, and I, and it was like, you know, do you think, 
that engineers would do a better job if they had to put their full name, their phone number, and their home address on all their drawings, you know, because because what happens is I get the drawing from someone and you're like, oh my God, who drew this? What is this? What is going on? It doesn't even make sense. And the only th thing you know about the guy who drew it is his initials. And you're like, man, I wish I could call him right now, right? Find out what's going on here. But, but you know, there's a certain level of like, like take pride in your work, you know, like if you don't want to take pride in your work, go do something else. Like these are not the areas to be half doing your job, right? You need to like, be like, yeah, I did it. I did a good job. And like, that makes you feel good when you're like, you know, yeah, I, 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 the guy had a problem. He called me, I took care of it. I solved it. They're out there and they're making money doing their job and it's, it's safe and it's being effective. It's being productive. So I think life is like that in general, like really like it's about being productive, right? Doing things that are just moving forward. It doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but like things that are productive and useful, right? Everyone wants to feel useful and wants to be productive and have, you know, good relationships, right? And that's kind of like, if you can have that well at work as well as in your personal life, right? That's a huge win. You know, I feel like that's kind of what it's all about. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you make money or don't make money or whatever. You're not going to be happy if you're just sitting on a pile of gold, you know, like you have to have meaningful uh, work, you have to have meaningful relationships you have, and you have to enjoy what you do. Right. So, so I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. And, you know, there's stressful times and things like that, where it doesn't, you know, things don't work and, and, you know, I'm like, okay, it didn't work. You know, how am I going to fix it? I'm just going to do it again, scrap, do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. And I have customers and, and colleagues who they push me, you know, they'll be like, they're like, that's pretty good for rev, you know, rev dash, you know, you did a B, B, B plus job. He's like, but I know you can do better. And I'm like, you're right. I know I can too. I'm like trying to, trying to just end this project, but you know, and I know that I could actually do even better. And then I'm like, I'll go back and I'll do it again. So I, so I already came out with a B plus product and they're like, I know you can do it even better. And I'll go back and do it again, you know, because that's, that's yeah. part of the game. So know? as a legacy, if you were to say, okay, I'd, I'd like to have this particular legacy, it would have to be, uh, not I, and I gotta ask you also. Do you ever have trouble sleeping? You ever like uh, when you're when your mind's full and you really are kind of looking for that final? Do you stay up it late? I I I only usually the only time I have trouble sleeping is if I'm uh you know is actually if I'm like overstressed and I but I haven't burnt my like really like done enough mental or physical you know, work in the day or something like that. Right. So, and, uh, and, you know, my brain's running on overdrive, you know, I have a lot going on. I'm always thinking I'm problem solving, you know, so kind of multitasking, right. And doing things like that. And I'm, and I'm on my feet all day. You know what I mean? I'm always walking around doing things. I'm working hard. You know, I, I live on a farm and I'm working on the farm and all that stuff too. And, you know, at night and on the weekends. So, so I, you know, usually I, I have no problem is basically, you know, are you standing at a computer by the way? You are yep, standing. Yeah, yeah, I'm standing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I really don't sit all day. You know, uh, rarely. So, but you can't stand when you drive a bit. Yeah, you yeah. Get yeah. one of those trucks, eh? The, the <laughs> delivery trucks. But that's interesting. So, um, safety probably had a big part of your care and control. I mean, being part of construction. Have you ever seen a guy lose his fingers? That's a brutal thing. Uh, yeah, I, I have unfortunately I had too many of those, but I've seen a couple of them. Yeah, I haven't seen any anyone. I haven't seen someone lose their fingers, but a guy we worked with had a, a beam uh fall and crush his leg uh you know one time and you know and he just he he still tagged the crane and had the guy cable down and hooked the thing up and picked it up off of himself you know pretty hardcore um and uh and there's a there's been i you know i've i i know several people who have been involved with you know pretty bad uh accidents um who some you know can't work anymore or some are working again i don't get into the details but you know pretty pretty bad stuff so yeah safety is a huge huge part of it you know when you're dealing with things that are that big and that heavy going back to the heavy civil stuff um everything will kill you you know so you you really you have to pay attention and you you, you can't um take anything for granted like you got to watch your back you need to watch out for other people you can't and the biggest thing is booby traps you know you never leave booby traps for other people like oh i'll come back and set you know, you, you, you do it right the first time, 
and that's the thing is like people will you know it's like oh well it's 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 quitting time you know i gotta go it's like no no no. it's like you do it right you fix it put that beam down the ground make sure it's settled down you know put those the right way do it do it right or don't do it at all you know like i learned that you know when we were perfect example like um we the first time i was ever on a job we were running like big compressed air for big down the hole hammers right so you get the two inch air line with the boss fittings that you hammer them connections together and the guy bobby who i was with he he was like hey he's like let me show you something he's like he's like we lay out all the holes um he said if you don't have a hammer with you don't screw the connection together it was like because if you screw it together by hand and you forget to go back because you don't know which one you didn't tighten it's going to come loose and it's going to blow apart. And now you've got a two inch hose with a five pound steel end on it whipping around and it'll kill someone. Right. So, so it's like, you, you know, you don't put, so I use that all the time, right. It's like, okay, if I'm doing something and I have like hose clamps, for example, on some little thing I'm making, right. I would never put the hose clamp on and then walk away. It's like, leave it down off the joint and till you get the screwdriver to go back and do it. Right. So it's like a systematic approach of being like, how do I make sure that I don't cause a problem by mistake? Right. Um, That's invaluable. You know, and you learned that in the foundation business, right? Yeah. 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 So I learned a lot. I mean, you can learn, you know, a lot of lessons from anything, right? I've learned a lot of lessons from skateboarding, you know, I was going to say, maybe your legacy is to show, tell those young guys it ties together right? this class. Right. When you tell them about safety, yeah. whether it's skateboarding or construction mm -hmm. i gotta say it's uh it's highly valuable and i'll bet you that you'll save lives i mean you those people will go away and they'll remember something you said yep. which will save their life yeah you'll sure. never get credit for it but yeah but that doesn't matter i mean if you want credit for it then you know uh That's you're not going to have any progress right you, you'll never like you know it's, it's like they say like you know you know you, there's no limit to what you can do if you don't care who gets the credit right so if you've got that ego thing driving you, then you're not going to get anything done because you're just like, oh, I just want to get credit for it. So you're not going to let anyone else rise up. You're not going to let anyone do a good job. You're not going to let anyone else be, be safe because you just want to get a credit for what, right? Like, what's the point? <laughs> so Same thing as money, right? Money can yep. also be an equal, like money, ego. It, it seems to matter to a lot of people, but uh, I don't know if the, the best engineers are necessarily aided by it. Right. right. The best engineers generally uh, are deep in thought and uh, probably not about their stock portfolio. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think money's a tool. Right. So you look at like think about like a like a genius engineer, you know, uh, like like Nikola Tesla or something like that. Right. You know, he would never say that he was trying to get rich. He just was trying to innovate. Right. Trying to invent these things. So he was just, he would go and finance his projects and get collect money just to do the job. You know what I mean? He was trying to get it done and trying to get it done. And, you know, maybe, he, you know, he was, would try to maintain some certain lifestyle, but he was engulfed in his work. Right. So it's just a tool, just like a hammer in your toolbox. It's just another tool. Right. So he was actually backed by Trump's uncle, believe it or not. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Like Donald Trump. You've got to, you got to be liking him these days. Are you a, uh... You're probably a natural Democrat, but these days I imagine you're Republican. Are you? No, yeah. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I mean, I, I, I get, I kind of shy away from like talking about like the labels of, of you know, polit political, uh, you know, parties, right? Because I think the labeling of anything is really uh, a, an instant, uh, you know, exactly. kind of problem where how can you just take and group, you know, a certain number of, principles or ideals into one label and say, well, that's this type of person or whatever. It doesn't work like that. Right. So, so I have, I have specific feelings about different things. And, you know, for me, um, I would say I can kind of, kind of fall more into that classic, like libertarian, like oh, really like original kind of libertarian Republican type idea, but I have other thoughts, th thoughts about different things, but I like the idea of people having the, you know, uh, you know, individual rights and freedom to, to do, you know, what they want with their life and, um, you know, kind of that classic, like liberty and pursuit, you know, uh, you know, classic American dream thing, right? It's like, you know, that's, that's what it's, you know, here, that's, that's the whole thing, right? It's just kind of do what you want and try not to hurt anyone on the way. So, uh, 
Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great way to summarize it. I wanted to uh, thank you today for being on the podcast. We're pretty well wrapped up. I think yeah. I covered most of the points. Uh, and uh, let's keep in touch. You know, one thing I, I said I wouldn't mention, but I, maybe I'll just dig, get this in one, this last thing, because I think <laughs> the, 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 the listeners will like this. The, uh, the Samsung titanium iPhone case. It's like an iPhone yep. Phone case. Um, oh, the phone, how, did you phone actually, stuff, yeah. how did you actually build that to show them that you could do it? You, you know, that's an interesting quoting exercise. Yeah. And we won't get too much into that, but just the whole idea of you were able to get somebody to actually produce prototypes in order. For yeah. 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 We made, yeah, we made, so we, we, you know, in one of my businesses, which is, you know, in basically just titanium uh, product, right. We, uh, we made several different types of, um, uh, you know, phone frames and um, for a significant cost savings, but made out of, you know, basically aerospace grade titanium, right? So, um, I mean, I probably have, I don't know, I have some in the office here somewhere. I don't know where they are. So the properties are lighter, but stronger. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So typically, you know, the, you know, on a, on a cell phone, the main frame, which would be the rim, you know, around it. And usually sometimes the back or maybe in the center, you know, because a lot of times they have glass on both sides. Now, um, the main frame would be made out of aluminum because it's easy to machine. You know, you can do any, any type of coatings, platings, things like that, or, you know, cosmetic finishes, but aluminum is only so durable. It's actually interesting though. Now is the glass is actually stronger than the aluminum frame, right? So you put the, the glass is so glass technology has come so far the glass is scratches still right the strength of the of the phone it's amazing i like i don't even think they even need to use metal anymore they can just they can just use glass but so we we designed and we actually came up with a hybrid um technology so um kind of a combination of using uh titanium for the for the part that you see uh in molding for the inside and combination of those two so very very um unique sign and uh you know worked with a couple phone companies and you know show off some prototypes and uh, it was like uh, maybe three years ago or something like that. So, um, and then there were a whole bunch of, you know, I mean, just global issues. I can't get into the exact details, but issues with certain, you know, tariffs and, you know, international business type related stuff, not to do with our business particularly, but just, you know, trade, trade related issues between different countries that kind of could cause, cause a halt to the thing, but it'll come back. We'll, we'll end up doing them. Um, because we already have everything's done, like the design is done and everything. So you just wait till the right time. Did they pay you to do the design? Did they, 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 you got a little bit of money to do the design and then you actually got the purchase order, correct? But then there was complications in your supply channel and whatnot. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're basically, yeah. I think mo most of the problem in that case was to do with that the cut, the, the country that the, customer was in became a country that all of a sudden you know one morning you woke up and you're not supposed to do business with them you know so <laughs> it's like that's it's like that's one of those things where you're like okay i guess we'll do something else right so um and those things happen i mean we had that happen years ago when for example in my state in massachusetts right so i know most of your listeners are in canada but um so in massachusetts where boston is in our state um for example uh in 2015 15, I think it was, they, they did a ban on a certain types of, uh, you know, weapons. And, and at that time we were ramping up to sell those types of weapons, you know, so, you know, you see it on the news where all of a sudden they're like, these are banned. And I'm looking at the TV at the airport as I'm flying to a meeting to go talk about making these things. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. You know, like, looks like we're not selling those in Massachusetts, you know, in our home state. So it's like, well, we'll just sell them everywhere else, right? So, um, but yeah, that, that's the thing is when you have these, if you have a business interest or a product or something like that, and all of a sudden there's a, a some sort of a compliance or a, 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 a law or something that's an issue that stops that from happening, you can't do anything about it. I mean, huge companies can do something about it. What they do is they just hire lobbyists and they just, you know, they go out and take care of it, right? You know, uh, but... But, you know, in smaller situations, you know, you just, you basically just have to switch gears or figure out something to do. So, you know, you never know. That's what keeps you on toes. You know, it's like, for me, it's just problem solving. Like, I don't care what it is. Like people come to me all the time and ask me to solve random problems. It doesn't matter if it's mechanical, uh, you know, anything. I, I get involved with so many different things. It's just, it's just interesting, you know, so.
Yeah, very good. Okay, Mateo, well, uh, thanks very much. And uh, let's keep in touch. And certainly if there's anything I can do for you, give us a call. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it. Say hi to your family. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. See you soon. Take care, bud. All right. Thanks, Martin.